everyone. Welcome. This is session number 20, devoted to Ketuvim, Wisdom Literature, and the Book of Psalms. This is a replacement lecture for the one that I should have delivered during the course time, but I was away that day, and my three very able TFs stepped forward, prepared a lecture handout, and gave a lecture. Uh, for the sake of uniformity in this whole series, I am going to give this lecture myself now, but I freely acknowledge that I have availed myself of the lecture notes and the erudition of my three TFs. So, Eric Fredrickson, Jonathan Miller, Matthew Rasur, thank you much for your help. Today we turn to the third part of the Hebrew Bible, known in Hebrew as Ketuvim, known in English as the Sacred Writings, and sometimes we see the Greek name for it, Hagiographa, which is simply Greek for sacred, sacred writings. In the Hebrew Bible, uh, there are 11 books in this, uh, in this, in this collection, and uh, they are very varied in genre, style, theme. There, it is not really a uniform collection at all. It is sort of a hodgepodge, hodgepodge of things. In the Hebrew Bible, these 11 books are, first, the big three, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, then a collection of five, five scrolls, they're sometimes called, a collection of five scrolls that are small books that are have a liturgical function in the synagogue. And then we have sort of leftovers, the book of Chronicles, uh, the book of Ezra dash Nehemiah, and the book of Daniel. As a slight reminder, uh, let's look briefly at the parallel Jewish and Christian arrangements of the Hebrew Bible, just to make sure we know where we are. So on the Jewish side, we have a tripartite Bible. Right? First was the law, the Torah, then was Nevi'im, the prophets, and third of all is Ketuvim, or the writings. The, writing, the middle part, the prophets, you recall, is divided in two. The first half of the prophets are historical books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and the second part of the prophets are, well, the prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve. That's the Jewish arrangement of the scriptures uh, of the Hebrew Bible. The Christian canon is arranged differently. So in the Christian canon, you don't find a category called sacred writings. The Christian canon is not tripartite, it is quadripartite. It has four parts, and they are the law, parallel to the Jewish Torah, the law, historical books, roughly parallel to the first half of the Hebrew uh, prophetic books, the jo books Joshua through Kings. Then we have of hymns, songs, uh, poetry, we might say. And last of all are the prophets. So if you look at the books of the Jewish hagiographa, the Jewish sacred writings, we will find them scattered in different places in the Christian canon. So the historical books of the Christian canon will include the book of Ruth, which is an appendix to the book of Judges. Uh, and, will, and the historical books will include the books of Chronicles, Ezra Nehemiah, and also the book of Esther, books that are written in historical form. What we call the wisdom literature books, and I'll come back to that category very soon, Psalms, Jobs, and Proverbs, they're all included in the poetry section, along with Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs. And last of all, the prophets will include the Book of Lamentations, an appendix to the Book of Jeremiah, and, most importantly, the Book of Daniel. So, just to re make things clear, the Hebrew Bible of the Jews and the Christian Old Testament have the same books, but they are arranged differently. The, uh, the Table of Contents is different. If you open the books and read them, they will be almost exactly the same, except that the Jews read theirs in the Hebrew version, and the Christians read theirs in the Greek and Latin, and then translate into multiple languages. So the books are the same, the order is different, the table of contents is, is different. Why this should be so has been the subject of endless speculation among scholars, as to figure out, did the Jewish canon come first and the Christian canon come later, or the other way around? 
most modern scholars think that the Jewish arrangement is the earlier one and the Christian arrangement is the later one. But more important to me than knowing which is earlier or later is simply the idea that they are different. Right? The Christian arrangement has its own logic, which is different from the Jewish arrangement. And if we can go by the criterion of logic, we must in fact concede that the Jewish arrangement of the sacred writings has no logic. It is just a grab bag of things, uh, an anthology of this and that. Whereas the Christian arrangement at least has certain, some thematic or formal elements that unite these various books in these, into these discrete categories. So that's what we're looking at today. So overview of Ketuvim, overview of the sacred writings, these 11 books. Unfortunately for us, we don't have enough sessions uh, in our course to devote the appropriate time and attention to each of these books. So we'll be devoting some attention to select, select, uh, select number of these books, and we even within these we'll be focusing on various select chapters or themes. Uh, in a more perfect world, we would have more time uh, to spend on all of these books because surely they all deserve loving attention. But alas, we will have to move along. Among these books that we're going to skip, there is one which is too important to skip, and that is the Song of Songs. So I'm going to talk about it very briefly here, simply because it, uh, it's just too extraordinary to uh, omit. What is the Song of Songs? In Hebrew, Shir Hashirim. To the ill-tutored reader, the Song of Songs appears to be a collection of love songs. He sings about her, she sings about him, uh, the two together perhaps talk about uh, the wonders of love and the powers of attraction. And all of this is studded with uh, beautiful imagery drawn from nature, fawns by the brook and uh, verdant fields and uh, ripe apples and, uh, uh, and, and the rest, and flowing milk and, and the rest. The first line of the poem suggested to ancient readers that the author of this song was none other than King Solomon himself, son of David, builder of the temple, and king extraordinaire, as described in the Book of Kings. So, ancient readers read this collection of love songs, just as we do, and ancient readers, like modern readers, are stunned to discover this collection of love poetry, some of it slightly erotic, uh, in the pages of sacred writ. So what is the collection of love songs doing in the Hebrew Bible? Answer, I don't know. Answer, nobody knows. But the history of the answers, in fact, is, ex is an extremely interesting uh, uh, subject for of, of discussion, which in fact has received a large number of books on the Jewish and Christian interpretation of the Song of Songs. In a nutshell, Jews and Christians alike, when they read the Song of Songs, they said, what are these erotic love songs doing in the Bible? There can only be one answer. Surely, it is a song about the love between God and his chosen people, between God and Israel, or between God and the church. So the he, the male figure, of course, represents God, and the female figure represents the church or the synagogue or the people of Israel. On that fundamental insight, Jews and Christians from antiquity through the high Middle Ages were in complete unanimity. The only question was to figure out whether God is in love with his people Israel or whether God is in love with his church of Christians. On that subject, Jews and Christians, as you might suspect, disagreed, right, that have a great deal of argument and counter-argument. But the fundamental insight that the text is really about not physical love, but about spiritual love, and it's really about our love for God and God's love for us, it was a key point in ancient and medieval scriptural interpretation of this book. Whether that interpretation has any claim to being accurate, i.e., is that what the book is really about, or is this simply some secondary interpretation uh, seized upon by pious readers who are otherwise shocked and offended by this book? 
Well, I don't know how to answer that question either, because how on earth do we know what the original intention of this book was, or more importantly, of the people who collected these love songs and then put them into the Bible, what were they thinking? It's not absurd to say that originally these may have been secular love songs, but the people who canonized them from the very beginning, from day one, they already understood these allegedly nominally secular songs to be, quote, really songs about spiritual love, about the love of God for his people. And then this this interpretive mode, this exegetical stance, becomes canonized in turn in later, for later Jews and Christians. But one could argue it goes back to the very moment of canonization itself. We don't know. Yes, B. Well, could you view it as just <clears throat> another kind of wisdom literature, how to lead a good life? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, Jewish readers put it in the wisdom literature category, again, King Solomon being an expert in all things, all things wise, right? So he will have written the book of Proverbs, he is, uh, allegedly will have written the book of Ecclesiastes, and more about that in the next lecture. The next lecture. So yes, it is sometimes put in that category when read in this allegorical, in this, in this mode of spiritual love. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of the non-allegorical reading, and, and this is a, an exemplar of how people can lead a very happy life. Uh, yeah, that, isn't, that line of inquiry of, of, of interpretation has been taken by some modern scholars in our late 20th century, early 21st century, that is to say, who see the Song of Songs as sort of an antidote to the Garden of Eden story. That the Garden of Eden story, we have, quote, the fall, at least when read from a certain Christian perspective. We have the fall, which is inevitably associated with sin, sex, death. Right. That's the Garden of Eden story. Again, I'm not suggesting that's what the Garden of Eden story really is about. I'm simply saying that is how it is, has been read and is still read in some circles, right? It has been read this way for a very long time. As an antidote to that, as it were, is a Song of Songs which celebrates love, both physical physical love, physical union of male and female, right? Uh, and the joy of life and the joy of sex. Uh, and here there is no guilt, there is no sin, there is no death, right? There simply is an affirmation of life. So this is a modern, a modern reading, or perhaps a feminist uh, reading, where also the scholars emphasize how the Song of Songs itself plays up love between equals. That is to say, there is no male dominant and female subordinate here. Uh, we, in fact, don't have domination of one over the other. We have two equal parties, one male, one female, who come together and joyously celebrate their union. Uh, so that's, the Song of Songs has attracted this kind of reading. Needless to say, this is a modern uh, or maybe I shouldn't say needless to say. I'll take that back. This is a modern reading, a feminist reading, or a, way, a reading of sort of seeing, to see the Song of Songs as counterpoint or antidote to the messages that are derived from the uh, fall story in the Garden of Eden. So one can spend a, easily a whole session on the Song of Songs. In fact, one can spend an entire course on the Song of Songs, which I did once in a former institution on the Song of Songs in Jewish and Christian spirituality and in Jewish and Christian exegesis. So this book remains uh, an, an, really an intriguing, intriguing uh, book, and its um, seductiveness has not waned over the centuries. It is, in fact, a remarkable, but also a very beautiful book, it's just simply very beautiful poetry uh, in the book. In the lecture notes, I've given you some uh, brief summary and brief comments about some other books, which also, alas, we will need to skip over, uh, simply by dint of insufficient number of sessions. So that's Ruth, Lamentations, Esther, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. Um, when you go home after class is over, you should go read all these books, because they're certainly worth at least looking at. But fr uh, frankly, I don't think they deserve a whole session each, the way the song of songs might. So that's the one I really regret not having one more session which would have been useful. But the other ones are certainly worth knowing something about, and you have some informa basic information on the lecture notes. So now I'd like to turn to the notion of wisdom literature, 
which makes up a large chunk of this third part of the Bible, the hagi hagiographer, or the, sa the sacred writings. Wisdom literature. Under this category, we include some of the Psalms, the book of Proverbs, the book of Job, and the book of Ecclesiastes, also called Kohelet, and perhaps, as I mentioned, if you stretch things a little bit, uh, Song, Song of Songs, which I will not refer to further t uh, today. The book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes are extraordinary books, and they do deserve lots of attention, and I will get that in our next lecture. Since Job and Ecclesiastes, or again, in Hebrew, Kohelet, right, are books which seem to reject the standardized teachings of wisdom tradition. They're working within the wisdom tradition, but they're anti-wisdom tradition. Whereas Proverbs and parts of the Psalms affirm it. So today we're going to look at the wisdom literature in general. What is it? What are the major ideas, major concepts of the wisdom tradition? And then we'll uh, talk specifically about the book of Proverbs. And then the book of Psalms. So let's begin. Wisdom literature. The Hebrew word for wisdom is chokhmah, uh, sometimes translated skill or even perhaps even technique uh, in various passages. But conventionally, a chacham is a sage or a wise person, and a chacham speaks chokhmah, wisdom. So these books are written by sages, and they spout wisdom. Wisdom tradition, namely sage advice from a sage person, uh, often written in the genre of an old man instructing a young man, an old man at the end of his life and career, instructing a young man how to avoid all the mistakes that the old man made, right? Uh, or something like that. This genre you find everywhere in the ancient, in the ancient world. It's hardly t unique to ancient Israel. On the contrary, you find it in Greece, you find it in Mesopotamia, you find it in Egypt. Uh, and in fact, the international quality of wisdom literature is uh, evidenced by the fact that there is a chunk in the book of Proverbs, and I give you the citation on the notes, where all modern scholars agree that this seems to be an Israelite version of a, an Egyptian, of a piece of an Egyptian wisdom book. Uh, again, who's on first, who's on second, we can argue, but the simplest way to read it is the Egyptian book is earlier, and the Israelites took that Egyptian piece, took it into Hebrew, and Israelitified it, you know, turned it into Isra Israelite wisdom literature, um, and which simply shows that the, the vice involved, the beliefs, the values, social values embedded in these texts were pretty much international uh, val values. So, that is uh, f uh, confirmed too by the fact that um, as a as a rule, Israelite wisdom books are not Israelite. What do I mean? They're written in Hebrew, to be sure. They're in the Hebrew Bible, to be sure. But the number of references to quintessential Israelite practices, beliefs, history, institutions, the number is small. In fact, sometimes you can go for long stretches and not talk about the Torah, the temple, sacrifices, the Sabbath, any of the distinctive beliefs, any of the distinctive practices, any of the distinctive institutions. They are barely there, if there at all. Similarly, the name of God, not always, but in some of these texts, specifically um, in the book of Job and the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, the name of God throughout is not the Tetragrammaton, not the YHWH, that God, that unique God of Israel, but rather it's Elohim, simply the deity. So again, this confirms his international focus, right? This is national literature on the one hand, but it's national literature which sees itself as part of a larger compass, a larger set of works. Again, the theme is Advice, how to live a good life. And this, of course, would be a subject for sages all over the place in the ancient world. Okay, we're going to talk about 
uh, standard or positive wisdom, it's been called. Uh, Kugel calls it orthodox wisdom, which I think is an anachronistic term, so I'm, I'm going to avoid that. Um, namely, these are the teachers in the book of Proverbs and then in various Psalms who uphold uh, traditional teachings, who uphold traditional values and traditional norms. The more exciting wisdom, of course, are those books which question received wisdom, which question received norms, or don't believe what you've been told. That's, of course, the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Job doesn't believe it for a minute, and Ecclesiastes doesn't think it does any good. So, but that's more exciting, and needless to say, attracts a lot more attention, uh, especially the question about why the canonizers of the Hebrew Bible would include such interesting, provocative works in their collection. An answer, a question for which I have no real answer. But we'll come back to Job and Ecclesiastes next time. Today we're doing the more staid, more conventional, and dare I say it, more boring and predictable uh, wisdom that we find uh, encoded or enshrined in the book of Proverbs most of all. So, the book of Proverbs. What do we have in the book of Proverbs? We have, after the introductory stuff in the first chapter, we have a, a long opening piece from chapter 1 through chapter 9, right, which sets out the theme, young man, pursue wisdom, young man, avoid folly, right? And wisdom is personified in a certain beautiful stretch uh, as, as a female figure. I'm not sure if she's a woman or simply a female noun and a female figure, but folly is certainly personified as a, um, uh, what shall we say, a woman of loose morals, right? Uh, and of course, you young man must assiduously avoid her or coming anywhere near her or entering her house because disaster will ensue. That's the theme of the, again, so folly versus wisdom. That's the opening chapters, chapter 1 through 9, that after that we have a series of collections of proverbs. Many of these proverbs have a kind of folksy quality to them. Uh, they remind us of qualities that we find all over the world, you know, from Iceland down to Africa. Uh, all cultures have these kind of folksy, homespun, wisdom kind of proverbs reflecting on the way of the world and giving sage advice to people if only they would heed it. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, especially after chapter 9, uh, when you get past this long section, then we have these collections of, po of Proverbs. So on the handout, I give you some samples of these folksy kinds of Proverbs. Hatred stirs up strife, but life, sorry, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers up all faults. Sounds like a fortune from a Chinese fortune cookie. As a dog returns to his vomit, so a dullard repeats his folly. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That has a Benjamin Franklin quality to it, I think, uh, or poor Richard's almanac. Like a gold ring in the snout of a pig is a beautiful woman bereft of sense. Politically incorrect, perhaps, but nonetheless a, a sentiment widely shared in, in the ancient world. A friend is devoted at all times. A brother is born to share adversity. Uh, and so on. These perhaps do or do not have great moral truth to them, but again, each is a freestanding sentence. They're not essays, they're not chapters, they're not paragraphs. They're sentences, uh, one following the other. Often is not the arrangement is just by um, a, a word that links one word to the next, or perhaps some sound, or uh, uh, it's hard to figure out a theme here. There is no theme. It's a collection of pithy proverbs to keep with you in your pocket to keep you guided on this path of the straight and narrow. And um, if you heed this wisdom, well, we'll come to that back in one second. If you heed this wisdom, everything will be fine. All, all will turn out well. Perhaps the most, the most interesting verse of all in that long stretch after chapter 9, which seems to go on endlessly uh, of these Proverbs, is chapter 25, verse 1, one of the very few verses in the Hebrew Bible where the Bible gives us information about itself. That's chapter 25, verse 1. These two are the Proverbs. Gam Ela Mishle Shlomo. These two are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of King Hezekiah of Judah copied. So here we have a verse which tells us 
how the book of Proverbs, at least in part, was put together. That King Hezekiah at his court, one of the things that the sages of the court did was to collect Proverbs attributed to Solomon. And here we're told in chapter 25, verse 1, here's another collection of Proverbs uh, attributed to Solomon put together by the men, presumably the courtiers, of King Hezekiah. Scholars have argued endlessly about the force of that verb, copied. We're not quite sure what that verb means. Uh, maybe transferred, maybe compiled. It's uh, tiku is the Hebrew word meaning of which is not clear, which is too bad. But anyway, we can see clearly, though, that King Hezekiah, as king, saw to it as part of his mandate as king is to collect the Proverbs of Solomon. And ultimately, our book of Proverbs is a collection of collections. And at least some of those collections, it seems, go back to King Hezekiah. You remember King Hezekiah, don't you? He was one of the good kings in the book of, in the book of Kings. Remember, Manasseh is the evil list of all the kings of Judah. Hezekiah and Josiah, these are the two heroes of the Book of Kings, the good kings of Judah. So this is King Hezekiah, the same fellow who nearly escaped conquest by the Assyrians, you remember, when Isaiah came to him and assured him that all would be well, and he narrowly escaped, Judah narrowly escaped being conquered by the Assyrians. Another extraordinary story in the Book of Kings. You remember that. That's this King Hezekiah. Okay, anyway, I don't know any other verse in the Hebrew Bible where the Bible tells us about how the Bible came to be, or how the biblical book came to be, uh, unless it be sections of the book of Jeremiah. But this is an interesting uh, verse, and it's interesting in its own right. Okay, let's continue. So, the book of Proverbs. Wisdom literature, Israelite, but international in flavor. Um, we have this long opening chapters about folly and wisdom personified as women and pursue the one before the other. And then for the rest of the book, we have uh, the string of kind of folksy, many of them homespun uh, uh, proverbs to teach you how to lead a good life or making observations about, about life. What is the takeaway from this? So here we have wisdom literature. Here we have the book of Proverbs. Well, what do I learn from this? Or what is the point? The point is the wise prosper and the fools suffer. The wise person, by following wisdom, following a sage counsel from the sage, and doing that which is wise or prudent or careful, taking advantage of good judgment, sensible judgment. The result of that mode of life is a good life. A life lived well is the good life. And well here understood means, according to the canons of wisdom, propriety, virtue. So what is the reward of virtue? Answer, a virtuous life. The virtuous life is the good life. That's the reward. And what is the punishment for a life of folly? A life dedicated to not wisdom? The punishment is a life of folly. A life not filled with wisdom. That is your own, that's your own punishment. In other words, the good man gets the good life. The good person gets the good life and the fool gets a life frittered away, wasted. So the wise has a happy, prosperous life, and the fool's life comes to ruin. Uh, what are the virtues inculcated in the book of Proverbs? The virtues are, or the vices are, greed, you need to be self-controlled. The virtuous man also supports the poor. Charity is one of the virtues in the book of Proverbs. Proper speech. Don't speak too quickly. Don't say anything stupid or rash. Think before you speak, especially if you are in the presence of noblemen or the king. Right? Don't open your mouth and say something stupid. Right? Think carefully before you speak. The, the fool just goes and blabs. 
right, and just uh, chat, chats off endlessly. Uh, diligence, labor, humility, avoidance of anger, self-control. These are the kinds of virtues and their opposite devices that are discussed by the book of Proverbs to be inculcated, some be, to be inculcated, others of course to be avoided. So this sounds very much like a poor Richard's almanac type of uh, piety, namely that the, the good man has the good life. I keep saying man because these texts do, but you understand, I mean the good person. A good person gets the good life and the fool does not. Now what's the role of God in all this? There is a clear strand in the book of Proverbs in which God is barely mentioned in the sense that the virtue, the the reward of virtue is virtue, and the reward of folly is folly, and that's just the way things are. These are the way uh, it happens automatically, it happens inevitably. So if you believe that right living is its own reward, an an ethical life is a life of ethics and consequently a good life, well then I don't need to have God into this calculus because this is simply the way things happen. And that certainly is a strong message of uh, many sections of the book of Proverbs in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in this wisdom literature. So on the handout I have some passages like that. Better is little with righteousness than a large income with injustice. The righteousness of the blameless man smooths his way, but the wicked man is felled by his wickedness. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever rolls a stone, it will roll back on him. This is simply the way the world works, according to these wisdom wisdom teachers. So what does the good life mean? The good life presumably means that you will live long, be happy, one assumes be prosperous also, just as a life of folly produces the opposite, the unhappy life, the life, the unhappy, you're right, the unhappy, the ungood life is the consequence of folly. Part of a good life is children. Part of a good life means that your name will live on. It's a common motif in this literature. Your name will live on, presumably through your children and grandchildren. And indeed, that is the ultimate reward, is to live into old age, be surrounded by your children and grandchildren. And what greater reward can there be? But that's what awaits the life of the virtuous person, often in these texts, both in Proverbs and also in the Book of Psalms. Now, there's nothing wrong with what I just said from a perspective of traditional Israelite piety, but except that traditional Israelite piety does want to throw God into this mix. We want somehow to be the ultimate authority standing behind this system, right? There should be a checks and balances system here or somebody keeping an eye on the books to make sure that the good get rewarded and the, uh, the, the evil, the foolish, the knave, right, gets, gets punished. Uh, and where's my guarantor that that's going to work that way? Well, traditional wisdom literature, as often expressed in the book of Proverbs, seems to be saying that this is simply how the world works. That is to say, trust me on this, says the sage, to the young man, right? Uh, you pursue uh, virtue and you avoid vice, you will have a long, happy, and prosperous life. We know that this is so, says the sage, says the sage. Well, for the theists among ancient Israel, after all, weren't most of them theists, they, they would add to that statement, well, I need to explain a little bit more that the virtuous, the virtuous man gets the virtuous life because God wills it so, or God sees to it that it is so, or God is the guarantor, the ultimate guarantor, that righteousness will triumph. God is the ultimate guarantor that the virtuous man will in fact have the good life, just as God is the guarantor that the fool, or to be a little more turn up the heat a little bit, the evil 
man will not have the good life or will somehow, somewhere, get punished for his deeds. Proverbs does not dwell on this, but it's very clear, though, that our book of Proverbs is already somewhat been theized, if I can use that word, in which the ancient Israelites take these fundamental wisdom ideas, right, and then try very hard to put it into the framework of a traditional belief of a providential God, namely a God who rewards and punishes. It's not spelled out the way the prophets do. That's what the prophets emphasize. The prophets emphasize how God rewards and punishes, how God keeps the books. The book of Proverbs simply affirms that this traditional wisdom teaching, namely that virtue is rewarded and folly is punished, that this fits very nicely into a traditional theistic scheme. And this you can see throughout the book of Proverbs in various passages here and there, beginning in chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 7, right there on your handout. The beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Right, I wish we could see these two conceptions are married. These two conceptions are brought together, and the one supports the other. So that wisdom notions of virtue, in fact, support, reinforce the idea that you are to follow the commandments or fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the ultimate guarantor that wisdom notions will, in fact, be turn out to be true. We moderns who are deist types, you know, like, like the wisdom literature without the God part, Right, you know, as if somehow by automatic automaton, you know, the world just works this way, that the good goodness is rewarded by, because the, li- the reward of a good life is a good life, and the reward of a, or the punishment of a bad life is a bad life. We'd like to think that were true. And we're not sure about to do with this God stuff, many of us, so we're, we're happy with the wisdom traditions. But the book of Proverbs, as you can see already, is trying to get God into this equation. Uh, as I said, the ultimate guarantor that it's going to work. But as we see in the prophets, you recall our discussion of, of the prophets, uh, there was vigorous discussion in ancient Israel about how did God really do this and how does God really make things work. The prophets were much exercised by this. But wisdom is a different voice in that chorus. And next lecture we'll come back to that theme of Job and Ecclesiastes. Uh, which questioned this traditionally this traditional wisdom which I've just described. Now we're going to talk about the other main book of the Ketuvim, and that's the book of Psalms. Psalms is the Greek name for the book. Um, it literally comes from the verb to pluck, because you're plucking strings on a harp. So these are songs we might translate that. In Hebrew it's called Tehilim, which literally means praises, uh, songs of praise. Uh, pr- uh, Tehillah is a singular, Tehillim, plural. Uh, we are praising God. And that's the first important point about the book of Psalms. The entire book is about God. There is not a psalm in the book of which God is not the main character. It's either to God or it's about God. These are songs of praise to or about God. Although praise understood loosely, as we'll see in a second. The traditional view is that King David, father of the aforementioned King Solomon, right? King David is the author, quote-unquote, of the book of Psalms. And in fact, uh, sometimes ancient Jews and Christians alike refer to the book of Psalms as the book of David, or simply David. A fair number of the Psalms bear the ascription to David, in Hebrew, le David, uh, although as modern scholars emphasize, there's some ambiguity in what that means, to say to David. Does this mean by David, or does it mean about David, or does it mean perhaps in the spirit of, or inspired by uh, David? Uh, Not quite clear uh, whether, in fact, we should read these as signs of authorship uh, or not. In any case, you don't need to be a modern Bible scholar to notice that there are any number of psalms in the book of Psalms which could not have been written by King David. And modern scholars emphasize that we have in this anthology of of songs or poems, we have a wide range, not only of genres, but a wide range of dates. So some are very, quote, early, quote, unquote, 
And what everybody's favorite candidate for that is Psalm 29, which is discussed by Kugel. Uh, which Psalm 29, uh, uh, Sing unto the Lord, B'nai Elim, sons of the mighty ones, sons of God, sons of the gods. I'm not quite sure how to translate that. Right? The imagery of Psalm 29 comes straight out of Ugaritic poetry, poetry writ- written up in what's now Lebanon or, or the Syrian coast region. Um, which seems to take hymns that are originally describing Baal and are transferred and translated to describe the God of Israel. Nothing wrong with that, except that the imagery comes from poetry that we assume is, a, is at least a thousand years older than King David, or several hundred years older than King David. That means Psalm 29. On the other hand, we have Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept as we remembered Zion clearly a reference to the exile of 587 or maybe 597 uh, BCE. And some modern scholars have argued there are even later psalms in, in the book, perhaps down into Hellenistic times. Hellenistic times, remember, 4th, 3rd, 2nd centuries BC. So we all agree that King David traditionally had a major uh, formative role in the emergence of this collection of psalms, perhaps, 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 for all we know, he actually wrote some psalms, right? This we don't know, but our collection as we have it is not by King David, and in fact it is a broad uh, uh, collection spanning centuries of ancient Israelite poetry writing. Okay, more important than that. Okay, so it's not by King David, but it's uh, some of them were inspired perhaps by King David, wide range of dates, okay, very nice. Um, more importantly, for our purposes, as usual, is what's the book about? All right, so two, psalms can be broadly classified into two broad categories, and each of these categories, in turn, has numerous subtypes. What are the two main types? They are thank you and please. These are the two main types. So thank you, these are hymns of praise. God, you are wondrous and powerful. God, we love you. God, we yearn to be in your presence. We yearn to sit and dwell in, in, your, in your temple. Uh, the righteous man is the man who is blessed by God. And so on and so on. Which These are hymns of praise. Which I would say fundamentally are thank you. But some of them are not so coarse as to be thank you. They just, we love God. More interesting ones are the please uh, psalms. The please psalms, again, have a wide range of types. Uh, Some of them are things like, God, give grand victory to our king. Or, God, I'm really in a terrible way. I need your help. Sometimes with shape, strengthened by things like, my enemies mock me. And where are you, O God? Why aren't you saving me when I need you? That could be either in the plural or the singular. Or the nations round about have attacked us and mocked us, and they belittle you, O God. Surely you need to come to defend your own reputation. Not just me. It's you we're worried about. So the wide range of types, but fundamentally we see uh, the hymns of praise, the or thank you types, and as well as the please uh, types. And many modern scholars have propounded a wide variety of types, right, uh, arguing that behind these literary distinctions of genre are also religious or social distinctions of social location. Are they in the temple? Are they in the court? Uh, are they in the village? Uh, who is singing? For whom? Under what occasion? You know, the way modern Bible scholars do, they create castles in the air. So let's look at briefly at uh, a couple of these just to get a sense of what, what we see, find in the book of Psalms. So let's go first talk about the hymns of praise, where I was calling loosely before, thank you. But they're not necessarily thank you. They're just often, we love God, uh, is often the theme of these uh, Psalms. The most impressive thing, especially for us moderns, is to see in the book of Psalms, in these these Psalms, this overwhelming 
sense of love of God, this overwhelming sense of trust in God, this overwhelming sense of God's reality, God's presence. Um, not just in the cult, in the temple, the sacrifices, but in life. That for the psalmist, uh, God is presence is real, and God's presence is near, and God's love, and, and the psalmist's love for God is is evident. This is very striking, very striking to see. Uh, and these qualities explain why later Jews and Christians alike loved the book of Psalms, because they found in it expressions of this deepest spiritual yearnings. So I've given you on your handout uh, two specimens of, of this uh, type. One, one is Psalm 23, the other is Psalm 146. Psalm 23 is by far, I think, the single most famous, most widely recited, most beloved psalm, beloved of both Jews and Christians alike, uh, recited at various occasions, in which we can... the the psalmist's love of God and trust in God is just palpable and wonderful. So we have it for you in the King James Version, which is the only version you're allowed to read in English. I, you're not allowed to read that psalm in any other. That, that's the one we all know. It's Psalm 23 in, in English. The Hebrew is, if you want to hear a little bit of Hebrew, Vizmola David, Adonai Rovi lo achsar, Benot desha yarbid seni, Amei menucho tina haleni. Nafshi Yashovev, Yancheni Bagli Sedek Laman Shmo. Gam Kielech Begait Salmavet, Lo Ira Ra Kiata Imadi. Shiftacha Umish Antecha, Hema Inachamuni. Tarok Lafanai Shulchan Neget Sorai. Dishantava Shemen Roshi, Kosi Rivaya. Ach Tova Chesed Yerdefuni Koyeme Chayai. Vishafti Bivet Adonai Lorach Yami. That is Psalm 23. As Kugel discusses at some length, the English translation familiar to us all, or familiar to all of us who have ever heard the Psalms, of the King James is probably wrong, uh, philologically speaking. They, there are some obscure cryptic phrases which we, Hebrew philology has advanced since, since the 17th century, so we are now fairly convinced that we understand the phrases a lot better than they did. But that's no matter. Who of us would want to give up the idea of, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Who would want to give that phrase up? I would not. I think English language would be impoverished, right, if we were to admit that that translation is simply wrong. It doesn't matter. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Ah, it's beautiful. That's Psalm 23. Or uh, Psalm 146 is another one which is a little bit longer, so I will not recite it but you have it before you on the handout, again, where the psalmist is convinced that the Lord exercises benevolent, providential concern for the world. And all is right. Every day is sunny. Everything is fine. The righteous prosper. The wicked do not. God is king and wonderful. Beautiful. That's Psalm 146. On the other hand, psalms of lament, as modern scholars call them, often uh, are endowed with deep pathos, that you can feel the pain of the psalmist. Not just pain, but deep disappointment. That on the one hand, you have this confidence and faith and trust in God. But on the other hand, why is my situation so terrible? Why am I suffering so? Aren't you a righteous God? Where are you, God? And the pathos in these psalms are really, palp really palpable. And some of them are quite are quite uh, quite dramatic. These can be either in the plural, referring to somebody singing about the catastrophes that have befallen the people of Israel, notably the destruction of the temple, uh, notably the exile, uh, or some other catastrophe, or it could be personal, in which the person sings about uh, his, her perhaps own catastrophes and disasters and wondering where God is to help me out when I need him most. Why don't I see him? Why isn't God manifesting himself? So I've given you on your handout a couple uh, of, of examples uh, of these, notably Psalm, uh, Psalm 79, in which the psalmist argues that God needs to protect his own reputation. 
that is to say, the impotence of the people of Israel, not only is bad for Israel, but makes God look bad. So the nations round about will think that Israel as God is an impotent God. And that can't be good. Surely, God, you should manifest your power to, for, your own, for your own sake, so people won't say bad things about you. That's an argument that appears elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, but it gets good expression in Psalm 79. Hebrew, the book of Psalms ultimately became a, or maybe I should say, the prayer book for ancient Jews and also ancient Christians. And following them, as Judaism and Christianity emerged, this becomes the one of the most beloved books for both Jews and Christians alike. And it is recited regularly in the liturgy of both the synagogue and the church to, the, to this very day. We can see the beginning of that process in the Bible itself. There are two good examples in the Bible where a character in a story sort of stops the action, opens the mouth, and out comes a psalm. Not exactly one of the psalms we have in our collection of psalms, but something very similar to what we have in our collection of psalms, so we may call it a psalm-like text is what the narrator puts into the mouth of a character. And here we can see already from the point of view of the narrator is showing us how these psalms were used in private devotional uh, worship. So one of them is the story of Hannah, and I give it to you on the handout, uh, the mother of Samuel in 1 Samuel 2. You will recall here we have the barren matriarch motif once again, right? Samuel's mother Hannah, alas, is uh, one of two wives, the husband loves her more, but of course it's the other wife who produces all the sons, so the barren matriarch, of course, feels uh, worthless. In that society and culture, you know, a woman needs to produce a son in order to feel validated. So she comes to the sanctuary and she pours her heart out before God, which she's yearning, which she is uh, yearning for a son. Finally, she gets a son. Uh, she brings the son back and she had made a deal with God. You give me a son, I'll give him to you. And that's how the prophet Samuel grows up at the shrine of uh, Shiloh, in Shiloh, English Shiloh, Hebrew Shiloh. So the narrator in chapter 2 of, Sa of the book of Samuel has the mother of Samuel, Hannah, come to the shrine, present her son, and then she opens her mouth and gives a song, which a praise, a song of praise and thanks to God. At last, she has her son. Now, what does she say when she opens her mouth? Does she say, thank you, God, for giving me a son? Well, yeah, she sort of says that, but it's interesting to see how this little text functions. Right? She begins with, my heart exalts in the Lord, this is on your handout, my heart exalts in the Lord. I have triumphed through the Lord. I gloat over my enemies. Hannah, what enemies? You didn't have any enemies. You were childless. That, that was your problem. Shh. I gloat over my enemies. I rejoice in your deliverance. There is no holy one like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Uh, talk no more with lofty pride. Let no arrogance cross your lips. For the Lord is an all-knowing God. Okay, I'll skip a little bit. The bows of the mighty are broken, and the faltering are girded with strength. Da, 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 da. Um, I'm going to skip to the end to save a little bit of time. He is good to the faithful, right? He, the wicked will perish. Not by strength shall man prevail. The foes of the Lord shall be shattered. He will thunder against them in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give power to his king and triumph to his anointed one. At which point, we may want to say to Hannah, Hannah, you must have picked up the wrong prayer because you wanted the prayer of thanksgiving on the birth of his son, and instead you picked up the psalm, which is a prayer for victory for the king. That's why he's got enemies and foes who are laid low and the triumph of the king, that you got the wrong psalm, Hannah. The answer, of course, is she picked up the right psalm. Uh, as many scholars have noticed, including Kugel in your reading, right, the Psalms, while they often celebrate victory or um, 
a bewail a disaster, are always written in a general enough tone so that almost anyone in almost any situation can find himself in the text or can find me and myself in the text. So here Hannah, mother of Samuel, according to the first Samuel chapter 2, recites this psalm. The psalm is not exactly about the psalm of a barren woman who has been blessed with the birth of a child. It is seems to be a reference to the vic- a psalm of victory for a king uh, triumphing over his enemies, but it does have one line in the middle of it, which is very relevant to Hannah's situation, or could be thought to be relevant to her situation. While the barren woman bears seven, the mother of many is forlorn. The Lord deals death and gives life. So presumably Hannah herself, or maybe I should say the narrator of the book of Samuel, says, yes, because that line, which refers to the the, the barren woman, well, she was barren. Therefore, this psalm is completely appropriate to the kind of thing a barren woman might have said, or perhaps, for all we know, did say, when she came to the central shrine to celebrate the birth of a child after years of barrenness. In other words, these texts are very elastic. These psalm texts are all vague enough or are studded with images of all kinds, one upon the other, that ancients ancients could pick up almost any psalm and somehow find in it resonance, find their own situation resonating with what's written in the text. And that is one of the secrets of the Book of Psalms. Not only is their heartfelt spirituality, but is their vagueness, which allows them to be used in a wide variety of, situ- of situations. So to conclude on that last point, pious Jews and Christians alike really don't care about the different genres and types of Psalms that proposed by modern Bible scholars. They don't really care about the original author. They don't really care about the original setting. Uh, They don't really care about how the psalm came to be or how the book of psalms got collected or uh, the various strata in the the book of psalms or, in fact, the historical circumstances of the psalms. All of that is interesting but ultimately irrelevant. For the Bible scholar, these questions are of immense importance, but for living Jews and Christians, i.e., people living in a spiritual environment, the power of the book of Psalms is not any of those things. The power of the book of Psalms is the imagery and the intensity that the author is invested in in these texts such that Jews and Christians to this day find meaning and um, and a sense of fulfillment reading reading these texts. That's the book of Psalms.